He is nowhere to be found, and I promise you, he is running another scam. The stupidest thing we did was to trust that the bank was giving us accurate information. They say the best things in life are free But you can give them to the birds and bees I need money That's what I want That's what I want That's what I want Hi there, I'm Tom Natchew. Welcome to another episode of Fraud Squad TV. Fraudsters, scam artists, swindlers, grifters, whatever you want to call them, they're all in it for the same thing. They want to take your money in any immoral and unscrupulous way they can. You see, there's no ethics in fraud. It's only about the money, whatever it takes. And I mean whatever it takes. Even sometimes a life. It's not a small ticket item. Fraud is in the billions of dollars throughout North America, and it's increasing every day. Fraudsters have a desire to gain for themselves at any cost, so it's important that we all learn to protect ourselves and start fighting fraud together. Please stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. What percentage of thrift shops are run by actual charities? 15%, 30%, 45%, or 60%? Only 30% of thrift shops are run by actual charities. It's not always easy to tell the for-profit from the non-profit thrift stores. But if you're hoping your donation will be used to help those in need, take some time to investigate the store. Find out where the money really goes. You ever play the stock market? Well, maybe you make a career of it. Now, whether you're a Wall Street novice or a blue chip expert, you can fall victim to a fraud known as pump and dump. This scam is so named because the fraudster will artificially pump up a stock's value with false claims, unrealistic projections, maybe even a couple of phony news stories, and then dump his share when the value is high. Unfortunately for you and all the other investors, the stock soon plummets and the investor's money is lost forever. Let's take a look. I had a very uh, good friend who was a stockbroker that had never tried to sell me any stock and he called up one day and said that he had something I ought to buy, and I would just, I just did it. Jakey Sandifer, the owner of Sandifer Oil and Gas, found out the hard way that if a stock rises in value from 83 cents to $20 a share in just a few months, it's not to be trusted. And he should never have trusted convicted felon and fugitive Harris Dempsey Butch Ballow. Paid 83 cents a share. He called me in four months and said it's up to $4 and that he knew it was going to 10 and, and, uh, or 20. Trusting him, I bought some more in a deal called Titan Industries. Soon after, Jakey and his partner stepped up their action, the stock began to fall. Now he's beginning to panic, and he called his good friend Butch with some questions. He said the reason it was going down was that they were going to go on the NASDAQ, and that they hadn't gotten their paperwork in. But there was no paperwork and no NASDAQ. All there was was a couple of articles in the paper about the company and what they were up to. But that didn't seem good enough. Something wasn't sitting well. My stockbroker came to see me one Sunday night and said that he thought that we'd been had. So I go see a friend of mine with Baker Botts Law Firm and we sued for fraud. The trading price of the stock has been artificially inflated by innocent investors. The perpetrators and insiders on the fraud will sell into that higher inflated trading price, cash out, and make off with their profits while the innocent investor is left holding um, large quantities of worthless stock. In a landmark decision, the courts issued a judgment against Butch Blue, providing restitution to Jakey and his partner for the money they lost plus $8 million in punitive damages, but the investigators soon learned that they were just scratching the surface. We, and, and we found out that he had a pump and dump scheme. There were people involved in Florida, La Jolla, California, Monroe, Louisiana, Kansas City, Houston. We got all this 
information. And when we got the $8 million punitive damage, we started, uh, of course, that was enough to pursue it further. We contacted the FBI and the SEC and started criminal procedures. Various calculations by, by different groups on, on what the scale of uh, pump and dump stock frauds um, uh, are in any typical year, but uh, it, suffice it to say that it is a multi-billion dollar business with multi-billion dollar losses to uh, basically innocent, unsavvy investors on, in any given year. There was finally a judgment gotten against Butch Blue. He pleaded guilty. Uh, they dropped 11 charges. He pleaded guilty to one. Butch Blue is released prior to sentencing on $100,000 bail, 10,000 of which he quite willingly posted. Facing up to 10 years in prison and a half million dollar fine, Butch failed to appear in U.S. District Judge David Hitner's court for sentencing and remains a fugitive today. I quoted, was quoted in a Houston paper as saying that he scammed half of the people in the U.S. and now he's conned the U.S. government. Trying to capture the elusive Butch Blue has been a struggle for the FBI, the Securities Commission, and a lot of other agencies. To help, Jakey and his partner hired a private detective and spent more than two million of their own money. This story is not unique, sadly. People like you and me are often convinced to invest in stocks and bonds, both legitimate and bogus, by simple phone solicitations. He is nowhere to be found, and I promise you, he is running another scam. We're with our fraud expert, Craig Hannaford. I've got two questions, both in two parts. First of all, I invest whatever money I have and things start to take off. Should I be paranoid right away? Well, not necessarily. As long as you've had good advice and you believe in the stockbroker and the stock, there's nothing wrong with making that type of investment. You know, that's how people make money. They, they can actually make some good uh, money in the market. But what you have to be careful of is if you get advice from somebody you don't know about a stock you've never heard of. Well, that's the second part of my first question. Now if things are taking off okay and I trust everything going well, how do I know when to get out? Well, you know, these fraudsters are really good. If you get sucked into a pump and uh, dump, that's the, uh, that's the real issue, when to get out. Because the fraudster is working to pump the price up, and he's going to get out at the top. The best advice I have is don't get involved in these types of transactions in the first place. Generally, you'll be the loser. Okay, now, Jakey Sandifer is a smart guy, millionaire. You know, you'd think that he'd know better. Is this type of pump and dump fraud normally committed against guys who play the market all the time? You know, there's uh, no set pattern. I've seen victims who are very wealthy, and I've seen victims who couldn't afford to lose anything. You can't really say one person's smarter than the other. Victims come from all walks of life. The second part of the second question, there's an element of greed here, isn't there? Well, there is. I think everybody wants to make a good investment and feel that they're really smart, but it all goes back to your due diligence. Never invest in a stock that you don't know anything about, and keep watching your investments, and make sure that you know the person who is selling the stock to you. He's got your attention, doesn't he? Stand by, he's got even more tips for this type of fraud. Deal with a stockbroker you know and trust when making stock investments. Make sure you ask the stock salesperson where he's licensed and then do some checks with the licensing agency. Don't fall for a high pressure sales pitch to buy an unheard of stock. Always do some independent research before you invest in any stock. Don't go away, we'll be right back with more Fraud Squad TV. What signs indicate an investment deal is not legitimate? You find it through a spam email message? The offer is pressure, time sensitive. The investment is low risk with high return. It's such a hot tip, there's no time for documentation. Well, all of these are signs that the deal might not be legitimate. Fraudsters use high pressure tactics to force you to make a quick decision with little or no information. When it comes to investing in anything, take the time to really understand the opportunity. Have you ever sold something that you've used? A TV, stereo, an old sofa, a sports memorabilia, or perhaps even a car? Well, most of the time, our biggest worry is that we'll be offered too little for the item we're selling. So how do you think that you would react if someone came along and offered to send you more than your asking price? It's called an advance fee fraud. It's also known as an overpayment fraud. And it's becoming more and more common by the day. They're the scams that involve sending you a check that's well over the amount of money that you're asking for an item or a service, and then simply and politely requesting that you send the difference back, or maybe even send the difference to someone else. So you send the money, the check comes back phony, and you're held responsible to the bank for the full amount. 
Those behind these schemes are taking every opportunity possible to scam you out of thousands of dollars. So let's take a look at this story. Our first real clue that something was wrong was just about a week after we had deposited the check, the bank called us. Sean Moss and her husband Jeff were just like any other North American couple with children. The two faced the typical financial responsibilities of parents, a house, the monthly bills, and the feeding and caring for their kids. And so when it came time to put money towards one of their cars, money they really didn't have, the two decided they'd be better off to sell the vehicle. And that is where this story begins. It all started because we were selling my husband's 1961 Buick Special. At that time, um, Sean was a stay-at-home mom, so didn't really have the money to put into it, and it was kind of getting to that point where it needed some work, so I had to sell the car. I placed a few ads out on the internet to um, try and sell the car, and started getting lots of different emails from interested buyers anywhere from, you know, the United States to Brazil. I got a uh, email from a guy in Africa claiming to be an automobile dealer over there and was interested in my car. So sent emails back and forth, agreed on a price. One of the emails he sent me, he asked if um, one of his clients that was here in the United States could send me money and that way it would expedite the purchase because then he wouldn't have to go through a currency exchange, that kind of stuff. Um, at that point, it sounded kind of fishy, so, you know, started kind of throwing the red flags up. Sean and Jeff felt skeptical about this particular buyer, but they did want to sell the car. So the two decided that they'd go ahead with the deal, but be extra vigilant along the way. Sent an email back saying, okay, you know, that's fine. You know, it's like you can have the guy send the money and didn't really expect that anything would ever come of it. But, you know, a couple days later, we got a check in the mail cashier's check from the Bank of America for $8,800. I was selling the car for $1,600 and the remainder was going to get wired back to the um, transport company. So um, Sean and I had talked and said that we were going to ask the bank how much time that we needed to wait to know that the check was clear and good so that way you know we weren't wiring any money before we knew for sure that you know we were covered and safe. Often the, the victim is, is online selling a product, a car, um, a, a musical instrument. Uh, it, it's amazing what, what, what the bad guys will pick up on and, and lock into. Um, then they'll say, I'll buy it at your asking price. They send you a, a, a check. It's a certified check and it looks really good. It looks good enough to get through the bank tellers. I brought the check into the bank and I asked them how long until this check would clear. And they said 24 hours. I said, now I want to know for sure, not just when the check is available, the money's in our account. When the check is actually good money that I can spend without having any worries of it coming back to hurt us. And they said 24 hours, ma'am, no problem. Sean and Jeff waited a day longer than what they were told by the bank. The two then confirmed with the bank that the funds had in fact cleared before they took out the money from their account. So 48 hours later, I went back to the bank and before I withdrew the money that was supposed to be the portion for the transportation of the car that we were supposed to wire to the shipper, I asked the person there at the bank, can you verify that this check has cleared? And they gave me the amount of the check and said the date it was deposited. I said, yes, that's the, the amount that I'm looking at. And they said, yes, it's in your account. It's cleared. It's good. I said, no, this is never going to come back and bite me in the butt. And they said, no worries at all. And so it would seem that Sean and Jeff took every precaution necessary before getting geared up for the sale of their car. But even now, they felt it was safe enough to put the wheels in motion. The two would find themselves in a very bumpy road with their bank. The next day, Jeff went and wired that money. Um, the entire time, we never trusted the scammer. We trusted our bank that they were giving us accurate information about how the procedure went for checking the checks for the clearing process and that they were giving us an honest answer when they said that it was verified and that um, everything was clear. The bank, uh has to allow that check to go completely through the process. And 
an assurance um, that that it has cleared is something that the victim needs to needs to get. Our first real clue that something was wrong was just about a week after we had deposited the check, the bank called us and they said that the check that we had deposited for $8,800 came back as counterfeit. I knew right away because I heard Sean cry. And she goes, no, and it's no. like, it was at that point that, that my right. I could that just feel right. it in my gut. It's just like, that check was bad and now we're gonna be responsible for it. So that was the point when I knew, it's like I could hear her crying, you know, it just, it sinks in real fast. At first, when we found out we were victims of the scam, immediately I felt shame and anger and um, you know, blamed ourselves. How could we be so stupid? But yeah, that, that took about a day and that passed and then I said, the stupidest thing we did was to trust that the bank was giving us accurate information. Legally, what all we can say is that both sides came to a agreeable yeah. settlement. When we did go looking for a new bank, the first thing I did when going into a new bank was ask them if I came in with a cashier's check for $8,800 and asked you how long it would take for this check to clear. The bank that told us um, that it would take approximately 10 to 14 business days is the bank we made a new account with. The ones that told us 24 hours, we said, Thank you and have a nice day. Jeff and Sean learned the hard way about overpayment scams, but they weren't about to let their experience go to waste. The two started up a website called scamvictimsunited.com. While we wish we could help people financially, we found that just being able to share your story kind of as a therapy support group online really does help people to get through this, knowing that there's somebody else out there that's gone through it and has survived and come back um, has really helped a lot of people to get the inner strength to say, I can get through this too. I always look forward to the part where I get to ask a few more follow-up questions to Craig Hannaford. Okay, now I've deposited a check into my account. It's a foreign check, but if my bank allows me to draw funds against that check, doesn't it mean it's a good check? Well, you know, that's something that confuses a lot of people, and that's not the case. The bank may allow you to withdraw funds like five, seven days after the check goes in, but it could take 30 days or even longer for the bank to determine if it's a counterfeit check or some other fraudulent type of check. And they may come back and get that money back from you out of your account. So, you know, we're going back almost to the Wild West where the only way to be sure is cold hard cash. And come to think of it, didn't we do a show on how to counterfeit cash? That's right. So how do you know? You get a certified check, I guess. Well, you know what? The safest thing is not to accept a check from a foreign bank. I mean, you can ask for a money order. You can tell the person to wire you money through Western Union or through the wire services. But you really got to be careful before you accept a foreign check. And then in this case, they were actually sending money back to the person down in the foreign country. I mean, that's a, a classic setup, Tom, and we have a lot of victims out there who fall for this scam. I'm glad I asked the question, and I bet you've got some of your own. Craig's got a couple of more tips to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. Always wait for a check to clear before sending merchandise. Never part with merchandise until you are absolutely sure the payment is good. Be very suspicious if someone tries to pay you with a check for more than the price agreed on, especially if they ask you to provide cash in return for the overage. It's better to wait for an honest buyer than to lose your money and what you are selling in exchange for a quick sale. Overly complex methods of payment are a big red flag that something is wrong. There are many ways for a buyer to make payment in a simple, secure manner. Wire transfer services and internet payment services all provide quick, easy, and safe ways for a buyer to pay you. After these messages, more Fraud Squad TV. How much money is lost due to check fraud every year? One million, 10 million, 100 million, or 10 billion dollars? In North America, more than 500 million checks are forged annually, with losses totaling more than 10 billion dollars. If you're involved in a transaction in which a check is used, wait for the check to clear before you send the merchandise. Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. Has anyone ever told you that they have a great investment for you, one where there's no risk and you're guaranteed a huge return? If so, I hope you didn't give them any money because it was probably a scam. Only a con artist will tell you that there is no risk in investing. 
Investing always has its share of risk. You have to determine how much you're comfortable with. A real financial advisor will explain all of this to you. So before you invest in anything, make sure you understand what's involved. Do you know the difference between stocks and bonds or margin accounts and mutual funds? If not, do your homework. Make sure your investments make you wealthy and not a fraudster. Now Fraud Squad TV takes it to the streets to hear about some of the other ways fraudsters have tried to take your money. I signed up for a gym about uh, this time last uh, February last year and uh, I knew something was fishy after a month, so I tried to get my money back around March, and uh, they told me to come back in April. I was talking to some people, and they were taking money from people up until the day, day before the lease was up. Like, then knowing that they were gonna cheat people out of their money, it, it made me sick. Like, it was horrible. Like, like I'm a student and stuff, and me, 450 bucks, maybe not a lot to other people, but you know, it was a lot to me, and uh, I was screwed basically. Do your research, because if you're gonna, if you're gonna put your money into something like that, you should, you should really do your research first. I had a situation where the bank called me and uh, they were basically letting me know there'd be some unusual transactions uh, on my account. So I told them, you know, I didn't make those transactions. But nevertheless, the, the bank actually um, gave me a non-disclosure form, which I filled out and I didn't have to pay for it. Just make sure you check your statements regularly um, for items and that you may not have purchased. And uh, really make sure that you can keep a close eye on your finances. With respect to identity theft, my mother uh, one time was using her credit card and what happened was she noticed that someone else found the number and other information on the credit card. So what happened was the 100 or $200 was missing on the, uh, on the credit card statement she found online. She called the credit card company. She said, I'm not paying for it. And then the company had to cover the, cover the I think it was $200. When you get a credit card, if you have one, check your statement regularly and make sure you know what's going on. Make sure that if there's anything that's been purchased with your name or with your credit card, make sure that they're your purchases and contact them immediately. Thank you for sharing your stories. By telling us your stories, we just might prevent someone else from falling for the same scam. Now, if you want to learn more about protecting yourself from fraud, or if you have a story to share, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of Fraud Squad TV. If you're interested in this episode's stories, you can read more about them on our website. Or we'd especially like it if you'd tell us a fraud that might have happened to you. All you have to do is go to fraudsquadtv.com. Remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together. That's what I want